Hello. Before we turn back to uh, the Magic Mountain and consider the snow chapter, some of you had asked for definitions for jargon and medical terminology that the Berghoff patients and doctors use, um, and that Hans becomes familiar with as a habitué of the sanitarium. So I'll explain some of these. First of all, Blue Henry. Um, that refers to a blue glass flask carried by nearly all the patients and used to collect the infected sputum, that is the mucus, that they cough up from their congested lungs. This container is important for clinical purposes to determine if blood is present in the sputum, but it's also meant to control the spread of tuberculosis. Like COVID-19, tuberculosis is highly contagious and is spread by droplets um, from an infected patient's cough, but not nearly as contagious as COVID-19. And moreover, as you probably know, um, tuberculosis is a bacterial infection, not a viral one. The other consumptive patients, however, need not fear transmission of the disease because they are already infected, but outsiders are at risk. And given the uh, highly transmissible nature of consumption, it's remarkable that heavy, healthy visitors are in fact allowed to dine with their sick friends and relatives. Uh, there is no social isolation at the Berghof. Another term uh, some of you have wondered about is one that I mentioned earlier in my first lecture, silent sister. This is a clinical thermometer that selected patients are given to use during their daily rest cures. Unlike normal calibrated thermometers, a silent sister has no measurement markers. As a result, the patient using a silent sister can't know his or her actual temperature, but a doctor is able to read the status of the column of mercury by other means. Um, the idea of a measureless instrument of measurement, of course, seems absurd. Uh, and Mann introduces this leitmotif early in the novel to reflect Hans's loss of his temporal and spatial bearings on arrival at the Berghof. But the silent sister actually had a medical purpose. As Sedembrini explains um, to Hans by way of warning, some of the afflicted become so attached to sanitarium life that they don't want to leave, and thus they try to increase their temperature by artificial means in order to stay. In order to avoid that deception, Barons makes them substitute for their regular thermometer a silent sister in order to get an accurate diagnostic reading that they are not aware of. Two related terms, the half lung club and whistling pneumothorax. Mann invokes these terms, especially while describing Hermine Kleefeld. Um, the patients who are suffering the most common form of consumption, that is to say lung or pulmonary TB, often have an infection in only one part of one lung, and the rest of that lung is weakened but still viable. So in a procedure devised around the turn of the century, uh, roughly a decade before the novel opens, Barons makes an incision and fills the infected portion of the lung with nitrogen. Uh, as Joachim explains, this puts the disease part of that lung, quote, out of commission so that the infection doesn't spread uh, any further and the remaining lung can heal. In effect, the surgeon disables or collapses part of the lung by this artificial means. The word pneumothorax means collapsed lung. Well, most of the patients with surgically induced pneumothoraxes need a refill of nitrogen every two weeks, but the impetuous and highly sexed uh, Fraulein Kleefeld needs a refill every week. Now, it's also possible, as we've noted, for a lung to be overfilled accidentally with nitrogen. And this produces uh, constant spasms of uncontrollable hysterical laughter in one memorable case. The pneumothorax patients at the Berghof have formed what they call the half lung club, so-called because only half of one of their lungs is operational. The other half has been neutralized with uh, nitrogen. And with a wicked sense of humor, uh, Kleefeld and Herr Alban and others have discovered that as they walk along, they can expel nitrogen through their surgical incision in a loud whistle, a sound that startles Hans shortly after his arrival. Finally, there is this term, lung resection. Behrens uses um, that type of surgery, and it is in fact the type of surgery he is, now, he is known for, lung restructuring. 
This is a treatment for seriously ill patients with advanced tuberculosis, uh, a condition that has not responded to other curative methods. Essentially, a lung resection is the surgical removal of an entire lung or part of the infected tissue in a lung. Okay, now with that behind us, we turn today to the greatest chapter in the novel, Snow, which contains the most extraordinary and important experience in Hans Kostorp's life. It's the climax of his quest for knowledge about himself and the world. It's not the end of his questioning, but certainly a crucial culmination that reveals to Hans the unity underlying all the oppositional elements and principles that he has wrestled with in the world and in his own nature. Hans's journey into the snow comes at a time of maximum confusion and intellectual striving in his life. With Klavdia away, he has turned not only back to his own research in fields, as we saw, as far-ranging as botany and anthropology, uh, but he has also been, we've noted, the keen and questioning witness to the bitter debates that Setembrina and Naphtha stage debates in which they reveal their conflicting worldviews, but also, as Hans notes, contradict themselves and reveal ironic points of convergence when the extremity of their opposing democratic and autocratic visions brings them into unacknowledged agreement. Lying on his balcony, Hans finds that intellectual efforts and free speculation alone are unable to resolve his questions about the relationship of so many antinomies, body and spirit, freedom and authority, life and death. Nor can Hans resolve his ontological questions about what life is, how one should live it, and who he is, Hans Kostor, as an individual. So now, filled with questions, in his second year at the Berkhoff, Hans senses that he needs to leave the safety and comfort of his balcony where he plays king in search of answers to those questions and he needs to seek those answers in a more dangerous, active way, in a dangerous world at a time when winter storms have buried the sanitarium and the town in snowdrifts. We're told he had only two great wishes, Hans did. The first and stronger was to be alone with his thoughts and play king of the balcony. But his other wish, however, bound up with the first, was to enjoy now a freer, more active, more intense experience in the snowy mountain wilderness, for which he now felt a great affinity. Hmm. Now, as a result then of this second desire to move beyond his balcony into this snowy wilderness, Hans defies the house rules by purchasing a pair of um, skis, teaches himself to use these cross-country skis, and practices under the approving eye of Settembrini, who encourages such infractions of medical regimen and restrictions and regards them expression, as expressions of personal freedom. Uh, much as you remember, Settembrini had applauded Joachim's disobedient return to military life. Well, even before Hans sets off one day into the snow, and becomes lost in a blizzard and has a revelatory dream vision, even before that, Mann's narrator establishes snow as an element, as a kind of synthetic symbol, um, an element that seems to reconcile opposites by embracing and containing them. Consider the opening descriptions. On the one hand, snow is frozen water, that is to say, the element of life that makes possible the growth of the trees that the snow covers. But on the other, the snow is also unmistakably um, associated with death. It is an element in which the body can freeze. We're told thus that um, gazing to the cottony nothing, eyes easily could close and drift into slumber, and at that moment a shiver pass over the body, and yet there could be no purer sleep than here in this icy cold, a dreamless sleep untouched by any conscious sense of organic life's burdens. Breathing this empty, vaporous air was no more difficult for the body than non-breathing was for the dead. Yes, the suggestion is that snow somehow can induce in the individual a desire for sleep and simply to pass away in that element. Similarly, snow is paradoxical in this regard. It is at once a heavy material substance that weighs down branches, but on the other, there is something about it that seems, um, certainly to Hans in the beginning, um, almost immaterial in its lightness, as if snow has somehow been spiritualized 
as if somehow there's something insubstantial about it. Expanses of snow suffused with light rows and layers, one behind the other, leading your gaze into insubstantiality. There were towering statues of snow-clad Alps gazing down from the distance, awakening in you feelings of the sublime and the holy, the narrator tells us. Still another paradox in Mon's opening evocation uh, of snow is that it is, on the one hand, if you look at it, what appears to be a changeless monolithic uniformity that blankets the landscape in a, quote, primal monotony, a monotony that seems to erase all distinctions among objects as if it were a single seamless static element. And yet, as snow falls, it is, of course, the manifestation of turbulence and chaotic change, this element that looks monolithic and um, a kind of uh, uh, primordial oneness, nonetheless composed of billions of tiny moving particles. Thus, the description we get is of gusts that could suffocate you, drove flurries in the wild, driving sidelong blasts, pulled snow up from the valley floor to great eddies, set in whirling at a mad dance. It was no longer snowfall. It was a chaos of white darkness, a beast. The whole region went on a monumental, unbridled rampage. And yet, Hans Kostorp loved life in the snow because he found in it so, so many ways, act like a shore of a sea, a primal monotony. It is on the one hand the same, and it's on the other hand the very manifestation of constant change and difference. Now, Hans senses some of these uh, paradoxes, but he will come to understand the contradictory principles that Snow embraces more fully as he moves through his physical journey. But it is not a journey that he understands at first. Um, as anything more than a kind of foray driven by a curiosity. What he doesn't understand at first is that this is not simply a physical adventure, which he feels keen to undertake, but is also, and more important for him, driven by a need for metaphysical and moral discovery. It is a quest in those regards. But perhaps the reason Hans Kostorp loves, loves life in the snow most is that he senses that in its embrace of contradictions, snow might somehow lead him to resolve the riddles that he seeks to solve, even without knowing that that's why he's going out into it. When Hans sets out, we're told that he had, quote, no particular goal in mind, that is to say, no conscious specific destination. But he senses that he wants and needs to confront danger, even to confront death, as a necessary step toward knowledge. Um, and that he must therefore surrender himself in quote, the, to quote, the profoundest solitude to a precarious savagery beyond human understanding. Only encountering the inhuman and the seemingly incomprehensible can Hans understand what it means to be human. Now this act of comprehension, of course, this drive to comprehension, finds its origin not in conscious thought or conscious intention or in personal memory, but as we'll see, in an unconscious drive and an unconscious dream state that arises not from any personal recollection at all, but arises from racial memory. And it is this racial memory, this racial memory that has um, infused Hans's personal unconsciousness, but is far beyond it, that dictates his movements in the chapter, much of which Certainly, the beginning, he doesn't understand. But what Hans does understand was that um, as a young man, Hans had learned the exhilarating thrill of brushing up against the powers whose full embrace would destroy you. What he had not learned back then, however, was a taste for extending the thrilling contact with deadly nature until it threatened its full embrace to confront danger and to confront death. As he moved into the snow, Hans was an invader who came at his own risk, whose presence was only tolerated in an eerie, forbidding way, and he could sense the menace of mute elemental forces as they rose around him, not hostile, but simply indifferent and dead. From the start, then, Hans senses, for some reason, that he needs to risk his life, that he needs to face death until it threatens a full embrace of him. 
even though he doesn't yet understand that this impulse is what will lead him to the kinds of metaphysical and moral and ontological discoveries that he has been unable to make through sheer simple thought. But where does this desire then to discover mysteries of life and death come from? Well, it arises, I've suggested, not from Hans' own past experience, though we're told that as a young man, there was, of course, an exhilarating thrill in brushing up with and confronting death, even as a young boy. But it seems to go beyond that. It seems, rather, this impulse in Hans to confront death and danger. Uh, it seems to arise not just from his personal experience, but from some deep part, some intrinsic inborn part of his nature that, as we'll see, will help to define who he is in mythic terms, will help to define what his mythic identity is. Up till now, Hans's long-standing interest in both the physical and spiritual sides of death has led him, as we've seen, to various uh, inquiries, uh, to visits to the bedsides of dying patients, uh, to disquisitions with barons on the corruption of the human body and the way in which organic processes of life and death, of growth and decay, are constantly going on at the same time. And it had led him also to that vision, that desire to see his own x-rayed hand uh, in the skeleton there, which caused him to look, feel as if he were looking into his own grave. But even though Hans um, has a slightly tubercular lung, enough to stay there, he has never truly faced the prospect of his own extinction, the likelihood of his own death. But now in snow he does, by risking his life and encountering death directly in a primal moment and mastering his fear of death enough to learn from that experience. We're told now that he would stop not moving a muscle so that he could not even hear himself. The silence around him was absolute. This silence into which he now finds himself moving this vast abyss. And we're told that as he moves in a word, Hans Kostorp had found courage up here. If courage before the elements is defined not as a dull, level-headed relationship with them, but a conscious abandonment to them, the mastering of the fear of death out of sympathy with them, that is to say, out of sympathy with those forces of death that he has encountered. That word sympathy here is crucial. As Hans abandons himself to the elements, to this uh, vast snow and then blizzard, he feels sympathy for the snow that could destroy him and for the principle of death itself because he senses that only by facing them can he come to an understanding of the contradictions of human experience that he has grappled with but unable to resolve through thought itself. This sense that he is moving through this encounter with destruction and death toward knowledge is something that becomes increasingly conscious for him at the, as the uh, journey goes on, but which in the beginning had, he had not been able to formulate in, in that sense. Thus, there is the sense of this necessary um, existential encounter. If we can speak of Hans Kostort's sympathy with the vast winter wilderness, it is because he found it to be, notwithstanding the devout awe awakened in him, a suitable arena where he could resolve his tangle of ideas, a convenient spot for someone who, without knowing quite how it had happened, found himself burdened with the duties of playing king in regard to the state and condition of man. Well, a second key word in understanding Hans's journey, besides sympathy, is the word defiance, and in some way it operates in tension with the sympathy for the forces of destruction, because Hans, even as he is drawn to them, will defy them, will resist them. Uh, thus, Mann lays emphasis on this particular word. But there's only one word for what was happening in Kant's Hostorp's soul, defiance, in the soul of a young person, of a young man who has lived for years as this young man had, and then comes a day when something elemental erupts in a fierce, impatient cry of, oh, so what, or I'll chance it, when in short, prudence is defied, even repudiated, and so he plunged, Hans did, ahead into the long wooden slippers, gliding down the slope and pushing his way up the next hill. <laughs> 
And again, a little bit later, this emphasis is on defiance. For he had realized he had no right to guard words and gestures. He had chosen defiance, and all the hazards of his present situation could be chalked up against himself alone. Defying everything. Now, note that um, as Hans skis deeper and deeper into unknown regions, he is defying not just the rules of the sanitarium, which would keep him from being out there at all, but also defying um, Sadembrini's code of rational conduct. Sadembrini had encouraged him, but not to behave irrationally. Uh, Hans is defying reason. Mann tells us that, quote, the crazy fellow pushed on, feeling as if he were turning into a snowman. Now, in this realm, both Sedembrini and Knopf's words and ideas seem completely insubstantial. As he skis along, Hans thinks of Sedembrini as, quote, a windbag and an organ grinder who means well and thinks of Knopf as a Spanish torturer with flashing glasses. He realizes that the two men have, quote, been struggling pedagogically for my poor soul like God and the devil. But which is God and which is the devil? The very thought of them in those terms is, of course, uh, dialectical and dualistic in the sense that not the, but not Sedembrini, believe. Moreover, do such unreconciled antinomies really define the world, or can good and evil and opposites of other kinds ever be harmonized? Well, the answer to these questions um, is something that cannot be revealed to Hans. Uh, either through Settembrini's reason nor through Naphtha's mystical acts of faith. Rather, it requires, as Hans increasingly comes to sense, the perilous openness to life and death in the journey that he's engaged in as he skis through the snow. Now, beyond sympathy and defiance, there's a third crucial word that Mann invokes here to characterize Hans' pursuit of knowledge in this exposure to danger and death, and it is a word related in some ways to his defiance, duty. By this, Mann means that Hans means, I think, primarily Hans's sense of duty to life, his capacity to recognize the lure of death, the longing and sympathy for death that resides in him and resides in all men, um, and that certainly he feels powerfully as he feels his body numbing in the snow and feels the temptation to lie down, and yet it is Hans's sense of duty both to recognize this long-standing desire in himself and his sense of duty to resist it and affirm life so that he can learn more fully about himself, that um, this is possible, this affirmation of life uh, through an act of duty to it and an act of defiance to the death for which he feels such sympathy. That combination of duty and defiance in the face of a sympathy for the void is Hans senses the precondition for learning. Hans's duty is then, in his own words, to pass on, to move close enough to death, to learn its mysteries, and then to move past it, to defy it, and ultimately to feel a duty, as he does, to go on living. Mann makes this fairly clear. <clears throat> In fighting off attacks of self-narcosis by reminiscing drunkenly about their discussions, he thought as he walked along, he felt a sense of duty that kept telling him to fight off any suspicious diminishing of his senses in the snow. The desire, the temptation to lie down and rest crept into Hans's mind, disguised as the notion that in desert sandstorms an Arab threw himself in the face and covered his head with a burnous. Temptation was very great as great as he had ever seen it described in books, the temptation as he gets lost just to lie down and die in the snow, a temptation whispered from one particular corner the promptings of a creature in Spanish black with a snow-white pleated ruff and bound up with the idea and image were all sorts of gloomy, casuitical, Jesuitical, and misanthropic notions of torture and corporeal punishment. But Hans proved to be an upright fellow, and he withstood the temptation to lean forward and to move ahead. He associates uh, death um, with his dead grandfather. He associates death with Naphtha. He associates death with the snow. All of them come into his mind, and yet he feels increasingly this duty to live. Now, as I've noted, Hans becomes increasingly aware of 
that he has been motivated to go on this foray into the snow out of a desire for knowledge through perilous exposure to these elements. But he also seems to be led on in this journey from the start by a force that is clearly more than merely subjective. What I have referred to here is a sense of kind of unconscious force or impulse. But I would urge that it is not this unconscious impulse uh, at, that moves him through the snowy Alps, like Gerald Critch's personal unconscious will that pushed him to death in the snow. It's not just that unlike Gerald, Hans has a sense of defiance and duty to live in the face of his attraction to death. But more important is the force itself that is propelling him. It's a subliminal force urging him to this encounter with death, to a discovery of secret life. And more important, it's not just that it is a movement toward an encounter or affirmation of life rather than death, as with Gerald, but the force itself, the unconscious energy, originates, unlike Gerald's, beyond the individual unconscious. Um, this force has been guiding Hans on his trip from the start, be initially beyond his awareness of any particular intention, but this force, this transpersonal force, underlies Hans' needs to lose himself in the mountains and to risk his life at every turn. It is not something um, that is in any way a function of his individual unconscious. We're told that um, as he hikes, as he skis on, um, the real world, the valley populated by human beings, very quickly closed behind Hans again and was lost from sight. And since no sound could reach him from down below, now he was soon deep in his solitude before he even knew it, more deeply lost than he could have ever wished, so deep that the feeling verged on fear, which is the prerequisite for courage. Note that he becomes lost, seemingly out of a kind of unconscious necessity, but by no deliberate intention of his own. He seems to be moved by a force um, far greater than anything he can consciously understand at this point. Now, we'll see shortly what this transport, transpersonal force that is moving Hans is. And in Hans, indeed, will understand it briefly himself after he wakes from his dream. But before that dream revelation, Hans mistakenly thinks that it is merely his own personal unconscious will that is somehow moving him uh, beyond what he consciously is intending to do. Um, at a certain point, for example, when he finds um, that he has gotten lost, he says fear made him realize that he had secretly and more or less purposely been losing, trying to lose his bearings all the time, to forget what direction the valley in town lay so that he'd been totally successful. For a moment, Hans looks at himself and says, no, I didn't deliberately do this, but I did it sort of uh, unconsciously, um, secretly, that is to say, as if I'd been trying to lose my bearings without recognizing that I was. In short, chalking it up to the force of some kind of uh, personal unconscious will. Now, this thought comes to Han just before he pauses to reflect on the nature of snow itself. In doing snow, the snow discloses to Hans as he looks at it, having realized he's now lost. It discloses to him the synthetic principles um, that he had earlier partly intuited and that Mann's narrator had evoked at the start of the chapter. Those paradoxes and still more. Hans looking around, uh, thinks water droplets, that was snow, violently gathered up and frozen into manifold symmetrical crystals, crystals, little pieces, he thinks, of inorganic substance, like diamond brooches, like little delicate miniatures, the wellspring of protoplasm of plants and human beings. And among all those myriads of magical stars in their secret minuscular splendor, never intended for the human eye, no two were alike. It was all the result of an endless delight in invention and the subtlest variation and embellishment of one basic design, the equilateral, equiregular hexagon. And yet absolute symmetry and icy regularity characterized every one of the cold inventory. Yet that was, was what was so eerie. It was anti-organic. It was hostile to life. Life shuddered at such perfect precision, regarded it as something deadly, as the secret of death itself. Okay, there's a very great deal that Hans has summarized there. 
Hans understands that snow itself is inorganic, that it is, in a sense, hostile to life in its perfection, anti-organic, uh, that um, while it is itself, in its strange symmetry and coldness, not life, it is nonetheless paradoxically essential to organic life, because without water, of which snow is composed, nothing could live. Similarly, Hans recognizes that, on the one hand, snow is formless, as it obliterates the shape of all things, covers all things, landforms and objects, and yet also, as he describes it, it is, if you look at each single flake, each crystal, absolutely precise in its geometrical precision. In short, snow seems then to bring together Apollonian form in the extreme, as he describes the equilateral, equirectangular, hexagonal shape, um, and the Dionysian in its formulas and turbulentness. Uh, turbulentness. Um, it is in, as if in snow, Hans sees both the messiness and the chaos of human life, and at the same time, in snow, in the snowflake itself, mathematical abstraction uh, of a purity of form that is found never in life, but only, as Hans says, in death, as the secret of death itself. Um, more than any comprehensive argument um, that Hans has been able to summon in his thinking, in his efforts of intellect, his study of snow reveals to him an element that embraces all of the oppositions and contradictions that he's been struggling to understand and to reconcile. And still another discovery that he makes about snow is that while it appears at a distance to constitute an undifferentiated whiteness, um, in short, a kind of changeless monolithic continuum, that the crystals themselves never repeat. As he says, no two are alike. Thus, snow embodies both endless variation, when you look at it up close, and what appears to be an all-embracing constancy and uniformity when you look at it from a distance. In sum, then, as Hans meditates snow, he realizes that it encompasses at once life and death, form and formlessness, motion and stasis, oneness and particularity, variety and sameness. I hope you got that in your notes. As such, snow then is the proper backdrop for a dream, dream vision in which Hans now sees with even greater acuity the unity of all opposites that have been perplexing him. So his meditation on the nature of snow then is, I'd suggest, a fitting prologue to these discoveries in the vision that are going to follow. These discoveries begin when Hans finds that in his attempt to uh, get back home in the blizzard, he has walked in a circle and has found himself back at the same hut. We're told that, um, in fact, um, as he has been walking around, the fact is, he tells himself, you were tracing the whole time a wide, foolish arc that led back on itself just as the teasing year came full circle. And so you wandered around and never found your way home. Hans Kostorp took a certain satisfaction in recognizing the standard phenomenon, though it frightened him too. And he slapped his thighs in rage and astonishment that something so universal had arrived right on schedule, even in his own unique individual situation. Now, while the circle he has inadvertently described frustrates Hans, and remember he's being moved by a, a transpersonal force beyond himself, while that frustrates him, it is a purposeful, necessary uh, loss and uh, circling, because it is directed by a force that is both within Hans, but as I've suggested, transcends him as an individual. When he refers in the passage I just read, as he reflects upon this circle, to the universal within his individual life, Hans is on his way then to understanding what it is that has been guiding him. It is his racial memory, a psychic principle that shapes his search for meaning all along, 
and he is just now beginning to grasp, but will understand fully only when he wakes from his dream. By encountering death in the pursuit of higher knowledge, Hans is, after all, repeating something universal in his own individual life, repeating what many others have done, enacting a typological behavior that has passed out of the collective unconscious into the individual unconscious of Hans as he moves. Indeed, the very circle itself in which Hans has walked, which he compares to the circle of the year, leading him back to that same shed, that very circle expresses the principle in its shape of eternal recurrence, of mythic repetition. And it is, after all, repetition that is the very essence of mythic performance and mythic identity, as the individual repeats what his ancestors have done. Hans doesn't consciously yet comprehend this sense of a particular transpersonal force or racial memory moving him. Not yet, but when he stops at the shed where his dream occurs, he reflects, quote, this was doubtless the spot assigned to him, and he would have to get used to it. In that thought, Hans intuits something beyond his own ego, uh, and even beyond his individual consciousness, the sense that something outside himself has brought him there, assigned him this particular role, assigned him this moment. Now, this brings us to the dream itself a dialectical dream vision in two parts, whose setting is in an ancient Greek world, which arises in Hans' mind clearly out of racial memory, out of the collective unconscious. Hans himself has never been to the Mediterranean or seen this landscape. There's no personal individual memory here, and yet somehow he unconsciously remembers it. He is then remembering something impersonal, transpersonal, elemental in the entire human race that has been stored in the collective psyche and is passing from that source into Hans's own. In short, as he'll under understand, it is the collective mind, the collective psyche of mankind dreaming through him. The glistening curtain of rain fell, fell away as he saw a landscape with a rainbow arching over it with dense and lustrous green. And there lay the sea beneath, the Mediterranean, deep, deep blue, sparkling with silver, a marvelously beautiful bay opening to haze on one side and embraced on the other by mountain ranges receding to paler, paler blues, dotted with islands while towering palm trees grew. And he looks at it, and he had thought, well, Hans Kostrup had never seen it before, not even anything like it. He'd never vacationed in the South. He'd never reached the Mediterranean, Naples, Sicily, Greece, and yet he remembered it. Yet it was that peculiar sense of recognition that Hans celebrated now. Ah, yes, that's how it is, a cry went up within, as if he had always carried the blue sunshine now spreading before him secretly in his heart, hiding it even from himself. Well, you'll note that taken together, the two scenes that Hans is going to observe in this dreamland of racial memory summarize the different sides of his own nature and of human nature at large ever since the fall of Adam Quadmont. Let's consider within this landscape the two di uh, di uh, diametrically opposed or seemingly diametrically opposed visions. Uh, the first takes place in this Arcadian world I've just described and consists of beautiful people, ideal forms, uh, images of harmony, peace, and love. He sees a land populated in all directions by people and children of the sea and the sun. They were stirring and resting everywhere, intelligent, cheerful, beautiful, young humanity so fair to gaze upon. And at the sight, Hans Kostorp's whole heart opened up painfully, lovingly wide, young men engaged in archery, helping the unskilled with their bows and arrows. And he thinks, oh, it's, it's all so charming. This is a place of deep-seated ideals that bind all these people together. Hans, he meant the dignity bordering on gravity, though totally fused with good cheer, which alone defined their every deed, an ineffable spiritual influence, earnest yet never gloomy, devout yet always reasonable. Now, you'll note that um, in this sense, in the language I've just described, this appears to be 
a Greek scene of Apollonian perfection, one that would delight Sedembrini's heart. Um, this seems to be a world of classical symmetry in the architecture, in the cooperative efforts that unite the people. It is a place of dignity, of deep-seated ideals where men and women are happy because we're told they were always reasonable. Um, it's also charming, Hans thought. Yes, it's all so charming, this place. Yet, the fact is that a purely Apollonian world would be rather colder than this. And for Hans, this is a warm place, loving, playful, even sensual, uh, in a way that Settembrini's Apollonianism is not. It's a place of simple pleasures and games and indulgences, like fishing and archery, where amorous boys, we're told, whisper sweetly in the ears of the girls they're courting. In short, it seems to be a world that combines Apollonian elements at their best, uh, a kind of ideal form and beauty and harmony and reason, because of course, everything we're here is never gloomy and always reasonable, but combining those with what appear also to be elements of Hans's own ordinary, peaceful bourgeois life, um, simple, ordinary pleasures. Hans, in short, sees both these aspects, the bourgeois and the Apollonian, in this place, and appropriately because the place reflects not just human nature, but more particularly Hans's own nature. And this is one reason why he finds it so moving, so charming, those two elements within his own nature. It's also very charming, Hans thought, touched to the quick. They're all so pleasant, so winning. How pretty, healthy, clever, and happy they are. It's not just their well-formed bodies. A cleverness and warmth that comes from within, too. That is what moves me, which makes me love them so. The spirit and the purpose, if I can put it that way, that lies at the basis of their being. It allows them to live together so happily and warmly like this. Hmm. Yet, as Hans sees a mother happily nursing her newborn, he also feels himself in some way not entirely part of this idyllic world, although it clearly stirs both the best aspects of his Apollonian and, and, and bourgeois uh, nature. But there's something in him that is not entirely consistent with what he sees. And this, of course, suggests that there are other elements in Hans and in human nature that cannot be accounted for in these scenes of Arcadian life. And indeed, it is only in the totality of the dream that he will see those other aspects, the hybrid condition of himself and of mankind. Because as he looks on these scenes of joy and beauty, we're told it all suffused Hans with rapture. He could not get his fill gazing, and yet he asked himself anxiously if he was in fact allowed to gaze upon all of this, if it was not a punishable crime for an outsider who felt so ugly and clumsy and base to spy upon such sunny, civilized happiness. Well, a moment later, Hans feels a premonition when he sees a young man, who is perhaps a dream version of Hans himself, who seems to understand the anxiety Hans is feeling here as an outsider and directs Hans's gaze to a certain temple off in the distance. When Hans enters that temple, he finds the image of a loving mother nurturing her baby with her own body, replaced now by the hideous image of two witches engaged in devouring, a devouring that child. Hans Kostorp stood gazing at the statues, and for some dark reason his heart grew even heavier with fear and foreboding. The metal doors to the sanctuary temple stood open, and the poor man's knees almost buckled under him at what he now saw. Two half-naked old women were busy at a ghastly chore among flickering braziers. Their hair was gray and matted, their droping witches' breasts and tits as long as fingers. They were dismembering a child held above a basin, tearing it apart with their bare hands in savage silence. Hans could see pale blonde hair smeared with blood. They devoured the baby piece by piece, the brittle little bones cracking in their mouths, blood dripping from their vile lips. Hans Kostorp was frozen in the gruesome icy spell. He wanted to cover his eyes with his hands and could not. He wanted to flee and could not. They went on about their grisly work, but they had seen him now and shook their bloody fist and damned him soundlessly with the filthiest, lewdest curses of his hometown dialect. He felt sick, sicker than he had ever felt in his life. Like the first phase of Hans's dream vision, this second nightmarish part embodies more than just a single principle. 
It is Hans's most terrifying encounter with death, the thing that has fascinated him since his childhood and that has tempted him uh, and for which he's felt such sympathy. Um, but it is also the thing that Hans, in this journey into the snow, has succeeded in confronting and resisting thus far. But we also find in this ghastly scene not just hints of Hans's attraction to death in all of its uh, most uh, distressing aspects, but we also find in it excesses in the scene, excesses of the Dionysian principle. The witch's cannibal feast recalls what Dionysius' devotees did in their depraved celebrations. And we're reminded, for example, of Clavdia's description of how she enjoys cultivating evil when she spoke to Hans on another uh, feast, a Dionysian feast, Mardi Gras, Valpurgisknot. But beyond these Dionysian resonances in this scene of cannibalism, uh, resonances which trace back to the origin of human consciousness in Mons Monomyth, this scene of barbarism that Hans witnesses also recalls, in certain ways, the ritualized cruelty that Naphtha celebrates. The fact that this feast takes place in a temple, in a place of worship, suggests that the principle of demonic cruelty operates in man's religious performances. Now, if these two parts of the dream, then, reveal the totality of human nature and different dimensions of Hans himself, um, then the question is, to what extent can they be reconciled? After all, even before this dream vision, Hans has been trying to reconcile opposites. Now, in what sense then does the dream that I've just described reveal a potential synthesis or coming together of these antithetical elements, elements in which both parts of the dream suggest more than just one set of principles? Do the principles that we find encompassed within the entire dream, the principles of life and death, of good and evil, of Apollonian and Dionysian and bourgeois, do they merely coexist in opposition? Is that all that Hans discovers in this dream? No. What Hans finds on waking is that these principles that he sees now embodied so vividly these principles are co-functional. He realizes that they cannot exist without one another, but also that these opposing elements inhere within each other, and that man, in whom these principles are combined, human nature, let us say, must be aware of their co-presence. If he is to understand himself, just as Hans realizes that those beautiful Arcadians were aware of what was going on in the temple and behave with such loving civility toward one another precisely because they realize that reality that is part of their world and part of human nature. This is why the individual who may be an extension of Hans himself in the dream pointed him in that direction. They know that it exists and Hans must know too. Hans thinks uh, of them in this regard were they courteous and charming to one another, those sunny folk out of regard for that horror? What a fine and gallant conclusion for them to draw. I shall hold on to their side, here in my soul, and not with Naphtha, or with Famat, or with Sedembrini. They're both windbags. The one is voluptuous and malicious, and the other is forever tooting his little horn of reason, and even imagines he can stare madmen back to sanity. How preposterous. Note, that what Hans suggests here is leading him to an even more uh, profound realization and discovery. Hans now sees that the antithetical visions which seem to encompass the totality of human nature and his own cannot be separated because the principles are intermingled with each other that the oppositional principles are mutually interpenetrating, um, just as he has seen uh, the opposing ideas of Sedembrini and Naphtha, whom he now regards as windbags, sometimes overlap, uh, sometimes dovetail, though they will not acknowledge them. Now, specifically, the most 
important opposites of all revealed in the dream are the interpenetration of life and death. And Hans comes back to this. The image of life in one, the image of death in the other, they can't be separated. Life or death, death or life, illness or health, spirit or nature, are those really contradictions? I ask you, Hans asked himself, are those problems? No, they're not problems. And the question of their nobility is not a problem either. Death kicks over its traces in the midst of life, and this would not be if it did not. And the middle is where the homo dei, man, state is found. In the middle, between kicking over the traces and reason. And just as his condition is somewhere between mystical communion and windy individualism, I dreamed a poem of mankind. I will remember it. I will grant death no dominion over my thoughts, for in that it is found goodness and brotherly love, and in that alone. Death is a great power. You have to take your hat off and tiptoe around his presence, rocking the way, but it is not all. Love stands opposed to death. It alone, and not reason, is stronger than death. Only love, not reason, yields kind thoughts. Now, because all of the elements of both sides of the dream inhere in human beings, Hans suggests mankind's true nature, collectively and individually, is between opposites, which is to say because his own condition is one intermixed with all of the principles uh, embodied in the two parts of that dream, man is somehow in that intermixed condition, in the middle, uh, between all antinomies. He partakes then of spirit and sense, of form and formlessness, of kindness and cruelty, of individualism and collectivism. Man is the master of contradictions because he embodies those contradictions. We are all intrinsically, Hans believes, in the middle, though different principles since they are all combined in all of us, in different combinations of these principles, depending on the combination, that particular combination creates different individuals based on the dominance or, sub, uh, or, or uh, uh, remission of some, putting us then at different points, if you will, in the middle. Indeed, these variable combinations of principles of uh, Apollonian and Dionysian uh, of bourgeois give rise to the particular myths that we are born to enact. We'll turn now to that crucial question of Hans' own myth and what that myth is momentarily. But first, consider another of Hans' discoveries when he wakes from this two-part dream. How should he live, he wonders, given this knowledge of human nature that he has glimpsed in what he calls his poem of mankind. Well, he lays emphasis upon the fact that one must tip your hat to death, acknowledge death, because without death, life has no value. And yet, one must also defy and resist death. And the only way to do that is love. Love stands opposed to death. It alone, not reason, is stronger than death. Only love, not reason, yields kind thoughts. Oh, what a clear dream I've dreamed, and how well I've played king. I will remember it. I will keep faith with death in my heart, but I will clearly remember that it, if faithfulness to death, that if faithfulness to death and to what it passed rules our thoughts and deeds, that leads only to wickedness, dark lust, and a hatred of humankind. For the sake of goodness and love, man shall grant death no dominion over his thoughts. I've long been searching for that truth in the meadow where Pritzlav Hippie appeared to me on my balcony every day. The search for it drove me to these snowy mountains, and now I have it. My dream has granted it to me so clearly that I will always remember it. Of course, he forgets it a little bit later. But in this epiphanic moment, having in this poem of mankind opposed the temptation to death on his journey with a sense of defiance and duty, Hans now opposes death conceptually with a commitment to an affirmation of what he calls repeatedly love. But what kind of love? Surely not the passionate desire that he felt and still feels for Claudia shows shot, which he seems to allude to here as something leading to dark lust wickedness. No, 
That's not what he means by love here. Um, because even though that love for Claudia will continue, um, it is not the only love he's capable of. That love is dangerous, ultimately narcissistic uh, attraction to his own Dionysian nature in Claudia, uh, one that cannot combat death because the desire for Claudia carries with it a longing for uh, disease and moral corruption. No, it's as if he holds that kind of love in suspension, not that he's annihilating it by any means or denying it, but rather now recognizing in himself the capacity for a larger, different kind of love. The kind of love he means when he says love is love that stands opposed to death rather than being attracted to it. He means the kind of love that he saw in the community of beautiful men and women, and in particular in the love of the nursing mother for her baby, and in the loving reverence of those in the community around her who joined in that love by bowing their heads and crossing their arms, quote, in formal homage and genial friendship as they approached the mother and child. This love, Hans realizes, enacted with a full awareness of death, certainly as the Arcadians did, and a full awareness of man's capacity for barbarism, which they recognize that self-aware love in the face of death and evil is the clue to life that Hans wishes to live with and to live for. Now, this does not mean that he will stop loving Klavdiga in his way, but rather that love, that imprecise word which uh, encompasses so many different emotions, will be now for Hans predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly shaped by the vision of loving harmony that he saw in the first part of his dream vision and the celebration of life that he saw in that dream of the children of the sun. As Hans opens his eyes and struggles to his feet, he finds that the snow storm has given way to sunshine, strangely. He thinks of this vision, which to his astonishment took only 10 minutes of clock time, and he calls it a clear dream. But not absolutely everything is revealed to Hans in that dream. There are things that he still needs to try to work through. He begins upon waking from it, to understand the transpersonal origin of the dream itself, but not necessarily what it reveals about his own particular myth, the very myth that he has been enacting, however, in the entire chapter. But as I've noted, Hans does realize now that the source of the dream goes far beyond his individual unconscious. When he thinks of it now, he thinks of it um, as something collective. I thought so. It was only a dream, Hans babbled to himself, a very enchanting, a very dreadful dream. At some level, I knew all along that I was making it up myself. The park, the trees, the sweet moist air, and all the rest, lovely and the hideous, knew ahead of time almost, but how can a person know something like that, make up to exhilarate and terrify himself? Where did I get the beautiful bay with those islands and the temple precincts to which the eyes of that lovely lad stood far off by himself, that lad who directed me? We don't form our dreams out of just our own souls, Hans realized. We dream anonymously and communally, though each of his own, in his own way. The great soul, of which we are just a little piece, dreams through us, so to speak, dreams in our many different ways in its own eternal secret. Dream, yes. Its own eternal secret dream about its youth, its hope, its joy, its peace, its bloody feast. The collective mind is dreaming that through me, through us. What Hans calls the great soul that produced his dream is, of course, what Carl Jung would call the collective unconscious or that we would call racial memory. It is that vast psychic storehouse that contains all of the memories of mankind, uh, parts of which pass to individual men in their waking lives where we act them out according to our particular uh, mythic typology. Um, but these same uh, patterns, these same disclosures come to us in our dreams where those truths about our life and the uh, structure of human experience and of our own experience are revealed to us as they are not revealed to us in our waking life through dream images, 
uh, from what Hans calls a communal and anonymous source. Now, Jung suggests that we come closest to seeing the patterns that we're born to enact when we dream, because we are then closest to the unconscious foundation of our mythic identities, that our unconscious, personal unconscious alliance with the collective unconscious is, is freest and, and most fluid when we're asleep. But Jung, Jung does not believe that we're ever really capable of consciously knowing what our mythic identity is in waking life, even though we are enacting it. We do so, he suggests, without realizing it. But Mon, as I have stressed, believes that we can know and can enact our assigned myths. We can dramatize them, we can embrace them, we can live them out. But does this happen to Hans Kostorp in this most revelatory of chapters as it does happen to some of Mon's other protagonists? I think the answer is no. Neither in his dream nor in his waking from it does Hans consciously understand the myth that he has been living and is meant to live and will continue to live. Now, although I've suggested that Hans has a kind of uh, mythic consciousness or predisposition uh, from the beginning, I don't mean to suggest that it's something that he ever thinks of in the context of myth per se. His interest in his ancient family history, his interest in primitive ritual and, uh, and, and anthropology certainly point to it, but that doesn't necessarily translate into the awareness of any particular mythic prototype guiding him in his life, and particularly guiding him since he has arrived at the Berghof, uh, where he has, after all, flirted with death and sought knowledge all along, but without thinking of those particular fascinations with death and knowledge uh, in the context of any prototypical behavior. But the reader might begin to understand what Hans's own myth is. He is, to put it simply, the mythic, uh, a, a, a figure within myth that might simply be called the quester, the individual who strives for knowledge that is hidden to others. Um, and which takes him on strange journeys in thought and in bodily movement, especially into perilous encounters with death in its various forms. This is the myth of the quester in search of knowledge through a confrontation with danger and death of all kinds that Hans has been engaged on. This quester type appears, of course, in various mythic traditions. But the one that Mann explains um, in his essay, The Making of the Magic Mountain, that he had most in mind precisely for Hans is the Grail Quest. Hans is the Grail Quester, drawn from Arthurian legend. You remember in that legend, Arthur's men searched for the Grail, the cup that Christ drank from at the Last Supper, and struggled in that search to overcome their own imperfections along the way so as to be worthy of seeing the grail uh, and necessarily passing through Chapel Perilous, a place of death, in much the same way that Hans must face death again and again in the course of his life at the Berghof and above all in the Snow chapter. Mann explains that uh, as the mythic foundation that he was seeking to transmit through Hans in particular, even if it is an identity that Hans never consciously understands or acts out as lived myth himself. Well, of all the great grail questers in the Mort Arthur, um, only one, the virginal Galahad, sees that shining cup, and then only briefly in a kind of vision. The elusive embodiment, then, of the grail, of transcendental knowledge, is in that mythic tradition glimpsed rather than seized. It's always liminal. It's always elusive. And the same is true with Hans in his pursuit of the grail, if you will, of knowledge. Okay? He sees it in a vision, and then he wakes. Mann, I think, that suggests that Hans comes closest to that knowledge, that grail of understanding, in the Snow chapter. And as we've seen, um, in coming to that understanding, um, what he doesn't understand, however, is the particular myth he's engaged in, in that very dreaming itself. Um, that he is in the process unknowingly living out a particular mythic identity. Will Hans come to that discovery later in the novel? Well, we'll have to wait and see.
The long chapter that follows Snow, A Good Soldier, consists um, of two very different narratives. First, there's the ongoing intellectual strife between Sedembrini and Naphtha. And then there is the chronicle of Joachim's return to the Berghof and his death. Now, although these stories are entwined, I'm going to examine them separately and begin with Sedembrini and Naphtha, whom Mann's readers may at this point have come to find as trying as Hans does himself. After his luminous discoveries in snow, um, neither of these would-be pedagogues has power or influence over Hans that they had had earlier. He regards them both, though he continues to listen, as windbags. Leading up to the climactic argument of these antagonists, Hans visits the two of them separately, and the topic of discussion in both is the Freemasons. Now, as you may know, the Freemasons um, are a fraternal society that originated among guilds of craftsmen in the Middle Ages, such as stone masons. But over the centuries, the masons expanded beyond these um, sort of labor organizations, guild organizations, and became power a powerful uh, social and political order beginning in the 18th century and really even continuing today. Um, it's rather interesting uh, the way in which the Masons turn up in, in, in classic novels in War and Peace and Joyce's Ulysses and in The Magic Mountain. Well, um, Hans discovers that Sedembrini is a member of the Masons, which seems in some ways consistent with Sedembrini's rational humanism, but in other ways, as Naphtha is quick to note, it's quite surprising and contradictory. On the one hand, Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire and Ben Franklin and democratic leaders like George Washington and Garibaldi were Masons, all of which points out um, that they were, um, as Sedembrini sees it, in the cause of advancing knowledge and freedom, um, and he regards them as um, uh, free-thinking rationalists like himself, precisely the kind of individuals he believes um, the Masons were created um, to bring together. But as Naphtha notes, despite these Enlightenment associations, the medieval origins and rituals of Masonry are in fact rooted in some of the very principles of absolute authority that Sedembrini opposes and that Naphtha embraces. Masonic lodges across Europe still, and certainly at the turn of the 20th century, still demand silence from their members. Uh, and they have secret codes and strange atav um, atavistic uh, arcane customs, um, and they are enjoined to obedience to those ordinances, so much so that one um, is never entirely sure, in many cases, who is a Mason and who isn't. So strict is the code of silence about what they do. When Hans is talking to Naphtha, Naphtha speaks of the Mason's insistence on silence and obedience. Obedience to Hans thought? Well, listen here, Professor. It seems to me that Sedembrini would have no reason then for criticizing any fanaticism or terrorism in, in my cousin's vocation. Silence and obedience? I never would have thought that a free thinker like Sedembrini could submit to such blatantly Spanish requirements and vows. I detect something downright military, Jesuitical about Freemasonry. Ha! You detect correctly! <laughs> Not the respondent. Your divining rod is titching and tapping away. Yes, there is something terroristic in it, something anti liberal that Sedembrini doesn't know about. Now, mock, M Naphtha mockingly refers to Sedembrini as a, quote, third-degree master in this mysterious craft, as it's called, which, though it promulgated ideals of democratic brotherhood in the 18th century, was nonetheless, this Masonic order, limited to highly educated and wealthy men, um, so that it really wasn't so very democratic. And in that respect, because of its limited membership, uh, it ought to be something that Sedembrini uh, would abjure and find uh, obnoxious. Hmm. But what violates Sedembrini's worldview most of all in Masonry, uh, as Naphtha well knows, is that it retains, even in its 20th century form, mysterious rituals that trace back to its medieval period of constitution, but specifically to medieval practices of alchemy. Uh, 
Masonry, Naptha says, originally drew upon hermetic traditions of religious mysticism that sought to purify or spiritualize material objects, like dross metal through occult practices. Now, this led the Masons, according to Naptha, to a preoccupation with the purification of man himself, and the way of this purification, they believed, came through a confrontation with death. Thus, we are told, the path of the mysteries and purification, not to explain, is beset with dangers. It leads through the fear of death, through the realm of corruption, and the apprentice, the neophyte, the new would-be mason, is the young man who is hungry for the wounds of life, demands that his demonic capacity for experience be awakened, and is led, to be sh led by shrouded forms in the initiation rite, who are merely shades of the great mystery itself. Hmm. Well, we're reminded here that these rites of initiation in masonry are not at all in their confrontation with death, like the perilous uh, transformative encounter with death that Hans himself had just passed through in the snow chapter. And like Hans's mythic journey, these Masonic purification practices facing death originated in primitive rituals that are echoed in the Masonic initiation codes that it's members must go through. Like certain mysteries of our church, Naptha said, the Lodge's secrets have a clear connection to the solemn cults and holy excesses of primitive man, elements of the orgiastic primal religion, with unbridled nocturnal sacrifices in honor of dying and ripening, of death, transformation, and resurrection. Now, this mysticism and ritual and preoccupation with death in the origins of masonry and even in their surviving rituals, those are things that Sedembrini has conveniently elided in his celebration of the Masonic craft as something that is purely rational and democratic. And when Hans then goes directly to Sedembrini's garret after his visit to Naptha, he points out the things that Naptha, that, that Sedembrini is not taking into account. In Sedembrini's view, the Masons are founded simply on 18th century democratic rationalist principles and continue it in their effort to lead mankind upward, Sedembrini says, to the secular world order, that world democracy that Sedembrini has been striving for. They are, in short, for Sedembrini, a political organization dedicated to, quote, the art of governance. Nothing more, nothing less, he says. I am well aware that there are those who enjoy pointing to the apolitical origins of Masonic thought, but those people, such as Naptha, are merely playing with words, drawing distinctions that it is high time we recognize to be imaginary and absurd. For the man who loves his fellow man, there can be no distinction between the political and what is not. And the Masons understand this. Their rationalism and their moral commitment necessarily takes a political manifestation. And indeed, in Europe, many of the leading politicians throughout the 20th century into our own century have been Masons. Now, note that when Hans points out the early entwining of Masonry with mystic strains of Christianity and alchemy, and when he notes that some Illuminati, Catholic Illuminati, were Masons, Sedembrini just dismisses what he is saying, and for that matter dismisses all religion as having any role in society and certainly any connection to the Masons. Indeed, when Hans asks Sedembrini pointedly if he believes in God, Sedembrini, after some evasion, says in French, let us crush the infamous one, that being God. Let us crush God, because Sedembrini is an unbeliever, and he tells Hans that in the future all true Masons will repudiate religious belief as mere irrationalism. Hmm. Well, Hans notes the irony that in his anti-religious conviction, in his militant atheism, Sedembrini sounds, quote, dreadfully Catholic. That is, Sedembrini's atheism is so militant and absolute that it seems ironically akin to Naptha's militant spiritual faith. Again, Hans sees opposites converge. But Sedembrini, of course, as usual, have none of this. Instead, he insists that reason will triumph, and he looks forward to the spread of, among other things, Esperanto, the universal tongue created as what was to be a universal language that Sedembrini believes will unite all men. Language, Sedembrini insists, is civilization itself. Even, he says, the most contradictory words can bind us together. Well, having listened to Sedebrini and Naptha, Hans knows very well that that is not true, that the more they speak, the less they communicate. 
and merely speaking to one another, what they're really doing is speaking in their own idiolect. Hans also knows that man is more than merely the rational creature that Sedembrini insists. Um, and Sedembrini, the professed monist, uh, mo uh, monist um, uh, is an individual Hans understands uh, for all his rationalism and certainty uh, outwardly expressed of extraordinarily blindness to his own inconsistencies. Uh, as we've noted, for example, the inconsistency of an individual who claims not to believe in dualism, then dividing uh, mankind into irrational Asia and enlightened Europe, uh, and in doing so, invoking the kind of dialectical thinking that he disdains in Naptha. Well, when the two antagonists meet, Sedembrini makes a semi-comic reference to himself as the Virgil to Hans's Dante, of course, uh, from uh, Dante's... Uh, uh, poem, uh, which begins with a journey into hell and then uh, purgatory and then paradise, the divine comedy. Seeing himself this way as the, the guide, if you will, to Hans's Dante, he offers to assist Hans through the hellish dangers um, that he believes Hans will be next facing when Clavdia returns. Well, out of this casual joke, and there's nothing new about it because, after all, Cenabrini has uh, wanted to be and tried to be uh, Heinz's moral, spiritual, and intellectual guide all along. Nonetheless, out of this reference to himself as uh, the Virgil to Hans's Dante, emerges the bitterest encounter between Cenabrini and Naptha in the novel, which concerns their ideas about education and then about art only it becomes clear that they are no longer trying to convince one another of their argument, but increasingly clear to Hans that they are actually trying to inflict injury upon one another. As Hans and Joachim and Fergie and Weschel listen uncomfortably, they see these two men becoming more and more uncontrolled in their vitriol and less and less capable of communication or even coherent thought. And here came Herr Sedembrini. His opponent's contempt for the love of literary form, he cried, only too plainly revealed a taste for the frenzied barbarism of certain epics. But without a love, no true humanity was possible or even conceivable. No, not now, not ever. Nobility, only a misanthrope would christen the lack of the word, raw, mute reality itself with such a name as nobility. And they carried things to extremes, these two, as was probably necessary for the sake of argument, and squabbled fiercely over the most extreme choices, whereas it seemed to Hans that what one might find in spirit of conciliation, declare truly human and humane, had to lie somewhere in the middle, remember, of where man is, of this intolerant contentiousness, somewhere between rhetorical humanism and illiterate barbarism. In their personal antagonism, both of these men say things that they don't really mean, but are merely meant to inflict pain. Naptha doesn't really believe that education is useless, as he contends, because after all, he's an intellectual and he's a teacher of Latin himself, so when he calls uh, uh, Satimbrini uh, a Latin windbag, um, it clearly is a charge that could just as easily be uh, lodged at him. And said Ambrini doesn't really believe that Naptha is simply a barbarous misanthrope who is contemptuous of literary form. No. They take things too far in an attempt to injure to one another. But why do they wish to inflict such injury, such pain on each other at this point? Because they are both lashing out at the fact that the other, over the course of months, has destabilized his thinking. Despite the limitations and confusions of language, nonetheless, that destabilization has occurred. As self-doubt grows, their self-doubt engenders in both Naptha and Sedembrini a desire to lash out at the other for causing that secret doubt, that harrowing of their own soul that they carry on in private because of the way in which they have been forced to think by the other. It's no longer, then, what Cetabrini originally called the sharpening of positions through dialogue, which he had spoken of rather lightheartedly as blood sport. No, now it is a desperate lashing out against one another by two wounded, unhappy men that will end in real blood. 
Hans has decreasing tolerance and interests as he listens to these debates, and he takes the opportunity to leave this one, which is at the point of erupting into violence, when he sees that Joachim has returned. And indeed, Joachim has returned by this point when Hans sees that Joachim has become feverish. Now, this act of compassion for his cousin stands in contrast to the cruelty that Setebrini and Naptha are at that very moment directing at each other so desperately. Which brings us to Joachim's story, which will take me about 10 minutes. After seven months away, there's that number seven again, where he has risen to become a lieutenant, Joachim's lungs, never really healed, have forced him to return to the Berkhoff. His initial response to the news, Hans' initial response to this news, is peculiar. Rather than a sense of alarm, Hans is secretly pleased, but not surprised. Um, pleased that he will have his friend again in his company, and he concludes that Joachim's infection is a result of his suppressed desire for Marusha, very much in keeping with Krakowski's theory and very much in keeping with Hans' own experience of illness. Could it be you have forgotten certain refreshing fragrances, prominent breasts, pointless giggles that await you at Froschar's table, he thought to himself? Hmm. Joachim is coming back, Hans thought yet again, and he experienced a shiver of joy. I want to ask him if, in light of this, he's still of the opinion that the body is secondary and that in no way could it possibly um, be affected by desires. Now, one is tempted to dismiss this happiness on Hans's part merely as, and, and, and his suggestion that um, uh, Joachim is coming back because uh, in his inability to act on his desire uh, for Marishka, his condition has gotten worse. Once tempted to dismiss it as merely Hans's projection of his own cause of illness onto his cousin. But the fact is that when Joachim does arrive back, he is himself strangely elated, it seems, at the prospect of being near this woman, as if some part of Joachim wants to be there in the presence of a female he has so long tried to resist. This soldier, who regarded Hans's own escapades with Claudia on Mardi Gras to be a shameful betrayal of moral decency, can't suppress a pleasure in the fact that something in his infected lung has escalated and brought him back. When Joachim enters with his mother, we're told he is ebullient, asking, about, asking questions about the residents, not agitated, angry, frustrated, or sorrowful that he has had to leave his, uh, his troop. No. Having come back, we're told he abandoned himself to extravagant and exuberant exchanges, talking more now than he ever did before. And in this mood, Joachim goes so far as to tell Hans that he accidentally ran into Klavdia, who said that she would be returning to the Berghof after a trip to Spain. Hans is aroused not just by this news, of course, but by the idea of Claudia visiting Spain of all places. Spain, the most rigidly austere and Apollonian of countries in his mind. Hmm, what could possibly happen in that particular collision? Or is it that the Dionysian Claudia is drawn to her Apollonian opposite in Spain as she is drawn to her bourgeois opposite in Hans? Well, Hans speculates. Just as Joachim's consumption revived partly because of an unconscious desire for Mauritius, so it seems, uh, and has uh, overridden his love of military discipline, um, so too it seems that having returned, um, he finds himself now um, no longer longing to get back to that military world that had so uh, tormented him. Uh, to get back to before. Um, while his desire for Mauritius may, in fact, uh, even in abstentia, have contributed to his relapse, it's not the only reason. It seems that he was also doomed to return for purely biological reasons, because after all, as Barons made clear, he wasn't cured when he left. And Barons himself, 
knew that he would be back for very different reasons than Krakowski did. Well, after Joachim develops a suspicious sore throat and then difficulty swallowing uh, and begins to show a strange ominous expression in his eyes, as these symptoms after his return gather, Hans begins to ponder again what he felt when Joachim had gone away, that his cousin would die. Indeed, when Hans confronts Baron, he learns that Joachim is dying because the lung infection has now spread to his larynx. But consider the aggression that Barons directs at Hans after having dodged Hans for many days uh, when Hans had wanted to inquire about Barons' uh, prognosis. When he finally corners Barons, Barons is hostile. You want everything to be blameless, Kostorp. That's the sort of fellow you are. You're something of a coward, man, a phony. And if your cousin calls you a civilian, well, that's merely a euphemistic way of putting it. That may very well be here, Barons, Hans said. There's no question that I have many weaknesses of character, but that's the point. There can be no question of that at that moment. And what I've been trying to get from you for three nows is simply, ah, you want me to tell you, you sweet, sugary, deluded truth. Is that what you want? You want me to badger and bore me until I reinforce your damn phoniness so that you can enjoy your innocent sleep while others wake and watch and let the gale winds blow? My, you're being hard on me, Herr Barons. It's just the opposite. I want to, yeah, hard on you. And that's not up your alley. Your cousin is quite a different fellow from you, a man cut out of a different cloth. Barons completely misunderstands. He thinks Hans has been pursuing him so that he can get some anodyne words that his cousin will recover. Hans knows his cousin is going to die, and he wants a confirmation. Hans is not afraid of death, and Barons should know this. Thank you, Herr Behrens, he says. I know now that what's myself, since I assume you would not have spoken so, how shall I put it impressively, if things were not serious with Joachim? Ah, uh, yes. All right. Well, it's its larynx, isn't it? Hans asked his larynx with a nod at the director. Laryngeal tuberculosis, Behrens confirmed. Rapid deterioration. Not much hope, my lad. None at all, actually. Finally, he gets the truth out of the doctor. Well, Note that Barons is angry that Hans has forced him to tell the truth and so unjustly accuses Hans of what Barons is himself guilty of, a desire to avoid the truth, or in this case, avoid telling the truth. Hans, of all people, can face death. The visitor to dying men and women who confronted death himself in the snow is the last person Barons would have to offer what he assumed would be some sort of sugar coating. It is Barron's own fear, not Hans's. He politely tells Barron's, Hans does, that his accusation is unjust. But I think we must understand that Barron's anger here is directed not just against the fact that he has to tell Hans something that he doesn't want to disclose because it bothers him, but his anger is also directed in a certain sense at Joachim. It's a displacement of his helpless rage at Joachim, even though he uh, dignifies him as a soldier here, his helpless rage at Joachim for going away to begin with, especially now that he is beyond saving. Well, during Joachim's final weeks of life, he both knows and denies his mortality. Intellectually, the stoical Joachim understands that his end is near. He stares at the ground where he will soon be buried, and he cannot meet Hans's gaze for long because he sees in Hans's eyes the knowledge of his own coming death. Yet instinctively, Joachim has assimilated a form of disavowal of death that is not so much individual as a kind of uh, residue in humanity at large. So long as we are alive, some part of us feels that we will not die. Precisely, Mon explains, because death is somehow alien to our own experience. In fact, our dying is more a concern to those who survive than it is to ourselves. For as a wise man once cleverly put it, as long as we are, death is not, and when death is, we are not. Hmm. Hans Kostorp saw a great deal of this innocence resp responsibility, this denial of death in Joachim's character during these weeks, and understood that although his cousin knew, that did not mean it was difficult for him to observe a decorous silence about his knowledge, for his inner relationship to death was loose and merely theoretical. Theoretically, we know we'll die, but somehow existentially, ontologically, because we have never done it and will not be when death comes, there's a part of us that disavows it and doesn't believe it. It is only 
when Joachim, when Hans sees Joachim speaking at last to Marisha, surrendering to a desire um, that Joachim has seen as antithetical to the life he wanted to lead as a soldier. Only then, when Hans sees this, does he realize that Joachim can no longer deny his imminent death. Because for Joachim, this desperate surrender to pent-up sexual desire is a submission to shame, a loss of discipline, and thus for Joachim, a defeat of his will to live. He has nothing more to lose, but it is also as if he's given up everything to live for by now speaking to this forbidden woman. Marisha was in a reclining position, looking up out of her little round brown eyes into Joachim's face, which was bent down over hers, uttering soft, disjointed phrases to which she would occasionally respond with a smile or a nervous, disparaging shrug. And it shocked Hans Kostorp more than any other of his poor cousin's failing strength that he had noticed over the past weeks. Yes, he is lost, Hans thought, and sat quietly for a while in the music room to give Joachim time for whatever it was he was allowing himself out there in the lobby on this last evening. Well, after this, Joachim's doubts about his death are merely not a form of disavow as before, but after this, as he moves into the very last days, um, his only doubts about death are a result of mental confusion caused by the disease itself. Hans is there with Joachim's mother to witness his passing, and he does so both with deep compassion and with profound curiosity. Behrens notes that paradoxically, one cannot experience death because the moment of death is the end of experience. And often, therefore, the dying man is nearly insentient beforehand and so can't in any way consciously experience death itself. But if any, Hans wonders, he says about this, um, um, if anyone ever did come back, they could not tell you much about death, Baron said, since we don't actually meet him. And I know death, I'm one of his old employees, but we come out of the darkness and return to darkness with some experiences in between, but we don't experience the beginning and the end, birth or death. We're not subjectively aware of them. Hmm. This causes Hans, of course, to ponder. Could one ever be conscious of one's own death, record the experience of dying any more than remember or record consciously the experience of being born? Well, if the, death, if the dying cannot consciously experience death, how about those who witness death? Can they in some way paradoxically understand the experience of dying better than those who are going through it? Well, Hans wonders about this as he watches the mysterious gestures that precede Joachim's death and wonders exactly what these gestures mean, trying to interpret them. Around at six in the evening, he began to do something curious. Joachim repeatedly stretched out his right arm, the one with the gold bracelet around the wrist, until it was about at his hip, and then he raised his hand slightly and pulled it back again along the blanket with a raking or scraping motion as if it were collecting or gathering something. At seven o'clock, he died. Hans Karstorp watched reverently by the light of the red-shaded lamp. The gaze faltered. The unconscious strain left Joachim's features. The painful swelling vanished rapidly from the lips. A more handsome, youthful spread look spread across our Joachim's silenced countenance, and it was over. Is there a language to read here in what looks like a kind of gathering gesture of his arms, this mysterious raking motion, or in the youthful look that suddenly, immediately at the moment of death, falls upon Joachim's ravaged face at that moment of release, that transformation? Well, Hans will return to the question of what the seemingly incommunicable experience of death might be like uh, later. Um, the benedictions over Joachim's body include Baron's claim that death did him honor, crazy kid, which distills Baron's conflicted admiration for Joachim and his anger at him for going back to the lowlands. Um, the benedictions and also include Sedembrini's repeated phrase that this was a fine, esteemable young man. And then there is the most cryptic remark of all from Naptha. Naptha's observation is he gazes at the dead body, quote, only where there is no spirit are we respectable. 
What? This cynical elevation of dead matter, of corpse, over spirit, seems to contradict everything not the claims to believe in. And in so doing, this suggestion um, that um, uh, only where there is no spirit are we respectable, almost nihilistic suggestion, seems to point ominously to Naphtha's intellectual despair, to his self-destructive impulse in that despair, and to his own imminent death. Hans, meanwhile, sees again, looking at Joachim, the two sides of death that he observed as a boy looking at his grandfather's coffin, the spiritual and the material. As he looks at the corpse, Joachim's features, quote, stiffened and turned cold, as if they had become pure, silent form, a delicate material between marble and wax, almost as if the way in which the hardening of the dead man's flesh um, seems to become uh, spiritualized or immobilized in some way. And yet, at the same time, he soon notices that the decay of Joachim's body has produced on his face a cadaverous smile, quote, that bore within it the seeds of the body's degeneration. Okay, I know this was a long lecture. Keep up with the reading, keep questions coming, and I'll see you next time.